Hello again, and welcome to Section 4, Building Dynamic Frontends. Congratulations for making it this far. This is where the satisfaction really starts to set in. That's because we're soon going to see all the different things we've already learned coming together to form something really cool, a fully-fledged decentralized Ethereum application, or DAP. We'll start with an introduction where we deploy the smart contract that will build the front end of our DAP around. Then, in bootstrapping a React application and incorporating Web3, we'll begin to work on it by connecting our React app to Web3 and MetaMask. In building an Ethereum application with React, we'll delve into more advanced DAP functionality and start interacting with our smart contract directly from our web app. Lastly, we'll tidy up any loose ends in the front end of our DAP and take our React DAP out for an official test drive. Welcome to building a web application on top of the Ethereum blockchain. In this video, we'll be looking at the smart contract logic for playing tic-tac-toe on the Ethereum blockchain, and we'll be discussing our approach of how to build a front end around it. The smart contract we have before us represents all of the game logic for a tic-tac-toe dApp. If you're not sure what that is, it may be because tic-tac-toe is also called X's and O's or O's and crosses in some places in the world. Basically, it's a two-player game where one player places X's inside of boxes of a 3 by 3 square game board, while the other player does the same by placing O's. The goal of the game and what determines a winning play is to place three X's or three O's in a row to form a consecutive line across the game board. The main addition that our DAP contract brings to Tic-Tac-Toe is that it enables the option for game players to wager a bet of Ether on the outcome of the match. You can see that here, this comment for you. I thought this would be a good use case for learning building a DAP. That's because although the smart contract will always know the state of any game that's in play for us as humans, it's a lot easier to understand the state of a game by seeing a visual game board than by looking at the index numbers of game board cells and evaluating their values. Now, this is a fairly complex contract, but it's not super long, so it's fairly easy to understand just by reading it over, and it's pretty well commented. At the start of the contract, we have a very important piece, the game struct, that holds any information about a particular game, namely the cells and what their state is going to be. Also going to keep track of how much money is wagered on the particular game, who the players are, basically what their Ethereum addresses are. There's also an array of strings to hold their player names, so we can have a screen name. We keep track of the last transaction. The reason why we want to do this is because that actually tells you the last turn that was officially played. Now, we also need to keep track of whether the game has been won and if the money's been withdrawn from the game. Obviously, you can withdraw money from the game if you're the winning player, but the other use case for this would be if there was a draw, if the match finished and neither player won, both players can call the withdraw. Or the other use case is that if the game is just expired, it's an old game and it's no longer valid. But that's something we'll need to discuss more later. Of course, we keep track of the creator. And we also have this guess random number that we'll get to explaining in a bit. Now, of course, we always need to know which games are in play. This would be active games. Of course, this would differentiate them from games which are already over or games which have expired. And we control expiry, of course, with the timeout. Now we also have this mapping. It's pretty important. If we scroll down, first we should maybe say that it is a mapping of the game struct. Basically, you have an array of game structs. And if we scroll down a bit, we can see how that works a little bit. If we look at the get game info function, we see that it takes an index. Of course, that's an index of the mapping. 
so in this array of games, we call it by index, we can get any value or, or property that exists on the struct. Some of these next ones are a little bit self-explanatory. It gets the game timestamp. Get the players of a particular game. For bookkeeping purposes, you might want to know if a game has been withdrawn. And of course, these array indexes here, basically they're player one and player two. Has player one withdrawn? Has player two withdrawn? Now here's an important one. This will create the game, a new instance in this mapping. So how does create game work? Well, it takes these parameters. Now the player's nickname, who's creating it, basically their screen name, it's pretty obvious what that's for. It will return the index of the game. That's the index in the game data mapping. But there's this one that I kind of need to explain. So basically, games are secured by this hash, which we generate by the imported contract. The front end of our DAP, it doesn't have to be explicitly shown to the user, but what you'll find happens is that the front end of our DAP keeps track of the random number hash. The other thing that we're doing with random numbers and random hashes that you'll see in a bit as well, because also the player who accepts the challenge from the person who created the game, they're also going to need to enter in a random number. And basically what this element of random entropy is doing in our DAP is it's also going to be used to decide who plays the first turn. Now, once a game has been created, a second player is going to need to accept it. And that happens, of course, with the accept game function. Once a game has been accepted, the creator also could have gone AFK, for example. So basically, we send a confirmation back to player one. Hey, are you still there? They confirm the game with another transaction, and then the game will begin officially, which you see a admit a game started event when this happens. So, of course, that's all the logic for how we begin a game. But once we're in a game, how do we mark a space on the game board? Well, that happens with this function, which is called mark position. This is helpful information because it explains this. And of course, if a game is expired or ended in a draw or victory, players need to be able to withdraw their funds from the smart contract. And of course, this happens with the withdraw function. And then outside of that, we just have our helper function, which is going to be used for generating our hashes, which secure the game. And this little one here is actually just something that should never be called. It's just basically a sort of like default security thing that we do in Solidity contracts. Feel free to always put this at the bottom of your contracts if they're payable contracts that are accepting Ether values. So now without further ado, what we can do is compile and deploy this contract. Before we do that, there is just something I did want to point out is because we're using import, of course, both these files are included in the lesson today. But what you'll need to do is because we have this import here, we need to open it in a different tab for Solidity to be able to import it. And you can do that by creating a new file just like that. So once you have both contracts open in two different tabs, go ahead and select your compiler version and start to compile. Of course, I've already done so, and it's gone through without error. So I can go ahead and make sure I choose the right contract to deploy. And once I do that, we need to sort of think about our constructor params. So if we look at the constructor, we see that it does accept a game timeout. For example, if you imagine a game that never finishes and it has a value of 100 Ether, and player two realizes that they're just going to lose. There's no reason for them to finish the game. They can just troll the other player by not submitting their final move and just letting the game go idle. But to stop the game from not being withdrawable is basically 
After the given timeout, which is created in the constructor, any player can withdraw from the game even if it's not finished. Basically, it's no longer considered to be a valid game. So, it's a non-mandatory param because it will default to 10 minutes. So what we can do is actually just deploy it with the default timeout. Once again, we are working on the Rinkby testnet today. But of course, feel free to process your deploy transactions and launch your smart contracts on whichever testnet you prefer. Now, of course, what you'll notice is that you actually after your first transaction confirms, you do get a secondary pop-up. And the reason why is because we have two contracts. We have both the tic-tac-toe solidity file and the libstring solidity file. So if you just go ahead and reject the second prompt because you think it's a double broadcast, don't do that because it won't work correctly. So you will need to actually confirm playing both. But what you'll see at the end so you will get one deploy instance. You just had to execute twice. So once we're loaded into Remix, we have all the necessary things right here. So now that we have all of our smart contract logic in place, we have covered the first dependency that we're going to need. Of course, the next thing that we'll be implementing is Web3.js. But in order to do that, we're going to need Web3 providers, instances, that are syncing the blockchain that can provide us with information to our Web3 powered application. What we can do is bootstrap a WebSocket RPC provider, and that will get all of our events through WebSockets and update in real time in our DAP. However, MetaMask doesn't have WebSockets, and that's why we had to bootstrap two Web3 RPC providers. MetaMask only works with HTTP RPC providers. So in order to get access to a user's account, their funds, their wallet, we're also going to need an HTTP RPC provider that will broadcast our MetaMask transactions. Of course, in order to process these transactions and listen for these events, we're going to need a web server and a web application, which is what we're going to set up in our next video. And to do that, we're going to be using the Parcel Bundler. It's an alternative to Webpack which I've been using recently. It's pretty easy to use. It's got basically no setup. And we're going to be using React.js.